Kings and Generals is proud to announce that this is one of the many incredible channels that we've partnered up with for Project Ukraine. Project Ukraine is a playlist dedicated to telling the past of the Ukrainian people to aid them in the present. Your likes, shares and donations to the charity we're collaborating with will have a direct impact in aiding the most vulnerable citizens of Ukraine. We have partnered up with the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kyiv, which was bombed by the Russian troops at the start of the invasion. Today, the Foundation has transformed its projects, refocusing its resources and efforts on purchasing and delivering humanitarian aid to civilians and evacuating people from combat zones. In the first week of April, the center provided over 7,000 food baskets to patients and doctors at Kyiv hospitals, to bomb shelters in the Kyiv underground, as well as to people with disabilities and elderly people who cannot leave their homes. They also provided targeted assistance to 3,354 people, delivering specific medications, food and hygiene products on individual requests. We hope that viewers would consider donating to this noble cause and help with the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. There aren't many men who can leave a country, start their life again, and help hold their new one together. But among those who can is Ivan Tuchina, a chief of staff in the Russian Empire, an industrial man who saw the early development of railroads in the Western USA, and a protege of General William T. Sherman. I should probably stop reading his resume before anyone thinks of hiring him. So let's get started with this Ukrainian-American general. Born into a Cossack family in the Donhost Oblast, the part in modern-day Ukraine, in the Luthansk region of the Russian Empire, in 1822, as the son of a major in the Imperial Army. It's impossible for me to know Turchinov's full military family background, but the fact he was a Don Cossack says a lot. These Cossacks were amazing horsemen, in the saddle, and terrifying. Not just the enemy, whom the raids could clear entire miles of supplies, put all they don't want to the torch, but also to the Russians, as the most famous threats to the Russian Empire came from Cossack revolts, be they under Stenka Razin, Kondati Polavin, or Emelin Pugachev. Oh, and those were all within 100 years of each other. These Cossacks are world-renowned. Napoleon wrote of them. Cossacks are the finest light troops among all that exist. If I had them in my army, I would go through all the world with them. These Cossacks spoke Ukrainian and are related to and have intertwined with both Ukrainian and Russians. They were given special permissions, like not having to pay taxes and greater autonomy. This has kept them separate from the rest of the empire in a beneficial way, and also great autonomy. They were troops that can be called upon, but otherwise separate. But that's his family. Who is Ivan Turchinov, also known as John Basil Turchinov, if you don't have the blind, unearned confidence to say Slavic names? Not people who can speak Russian graciously helped you with. He graduated from the Russian Imperial Military School in 1841 in the infantry. And in seven years' time, he put down the 1848 Hungarian Revolt. He apparently did well in this, and by 1856, he was a colonel, chief of staff, and a staff member to the Crown Prince Alexander, which he worked with during the Crimean War. But Turchinov had no loyalty to the Russian Empire. I imagine having the prince take credit for all of Turchin's and his staff's work didn't help, nor did the promotion of Russians over him for less work. Even more than that, Turchin's a Republican, and he wanted to go to a country where he would be free of aristocratic crackdowns on his freedom, leaving behind the secure, cushy, but unfulfilling job of colonel in the Russian army. He took his wife to a new land. Turchinov himself said of his immigration, I thank America for one thing. It helped me get rid of my aristocratic prejudices, and it reduced me to the rank of a mere mortal. If I have been reborn, I fear no one. No sphere of business scares me away, and no social position will put me down. It makes no difference whether I plow and cart manure, or sit in a richly decorated room and discuss astronomy with the great scholars of the New World. I want to earn the right to call myself a citizen of the United States of America. So he went where many immigrants would go, and all are welcomed. 
the USA. Well, he wasn't welcomed, nor were many slots at the time, but he and his wife made good work. And I should talk about his wife, because she is... fascinating. Or as others might put it, amazingly badass. Nadine Tuchinov was the daughter of Ivan's commanding officer. No, not the prince. She knows the military well and is always by her husband's side. Through hard work and a good education, became a civil engineer in Chicago, the hotbed of the Union, being the site of the 1860 Republican National Convention. And this was before Chicago was the railroad hub it would become. He worked at the Illinois Central Railroad. This man was incredibly forward-thinking. But the simple life of an architect for one of the future great industries isn't what is destined for Turchinov. Because in April 1861, Fort Sumter, a strategic fort in Charleston Harbor, is fired upon by the breakaway rebels of the Confederacy, descending his new nation into a civil war. He stayed with the state of Illinois in the Union. I mean, God, the 1860 Republican National Convention happened in Chicago, and Turchin met future President Lincoln around the convention, where he was nominated at. He is given the colonelship of the 19th Illinois, and using what he learned in the Imperial Military Academy, he drills them hard, and a little bit of his Cossack spirit he learned from his old drill master, Dad. He gives them the violent way of war. Cossacks are well known as being disciplined raiders, those who can turn out a yell and then break ranks to burn the enemy supplies to the ground. Fearless, disciplined, and effective. And here's where we build for some controversy. His men are well drilled, something surprising for the time, but also that Cossack flair. Just keep that dichotomy in mind. He is the only Ukrainian Union officer. There are about 5,000 Poles in the army, but for anything east of the Vistula River, oh no, not even known as the number of Slavs. There is great discrimination against Eastern Europeans in the army, as there is in the day-to-day -day life of Turchin. The military establishment aims for the aristocratic European ideal of gentlemen, and they look at Turchin like a serf. Ivan's regiment becomes well-known and well-respected, as does its commander, which leads the 19th Illinois commander to become a brigade commander. The 19th Illinois Volunteer Infantry, 24th Illinois Volunteer Infantry, 18th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, 37th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, form Turchin's brigade. The 3rd Brigade in Bird General Ormsey M. Mitchell's division in Major General Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio. He under Mitchell did a brilliant Southern action from 1861 to early 1862, which brings us to April 1862. We all know the main action with the Army of the Ohio in April 1862. Mitchell's capture of Huntsville, Alabama. 3rd Brigade does miss out on the action at Shiloh, Tennessee, but Mitchell's surprise take of Huntsville was to push around the important Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was done with much valor, and Turchin's name was on the rise. Which brings us to the middle of April 1862, where Confederate partisan attacks are getting worse and worse. Now, the problem with partisans, for legal reasons, is that they aren't official soldiers. That is their definition. They look like civilians, but you shouldn't treat them like such. With imperfect knowledge, mistakes are bound to happen, despite the fact they never should. The killing of civilians should be kept to a minimum. Now, one of these partisan raids happened at Athens, Alabama, where the 18th Ohio was being stationed. This unit was under the strong drill of Turchin, but before him, in a little bit sins, were known as rowdy. Again, that dichotomy showing up. 50 to 60 Confederate scouts under Colonel Scott overrun the regiment with the help of civilians, who chased the Union out. Or did it happen that way? Athens was a pretty Unionist town. According to some, this one I'll put my thumb on, it was a pretty Unionist town. But soldiers reported being fired on by civilians from windows. And we know some citizens greeted soldiers, but we can't confirm the reports of those soldiers. This all happened on May 1st. All we can confirm is that the 80th Ohio was chased out of town by Confederate scouts. However, this isn't what gets reported. 
what gets reported to church in Athens is in revolt. And with the help of Confederate partisans, perhaps the partisans is where the confusion of the civilians comes in, throw out his authority. Now let's look at it from Turchin's view. Yes, there is an order from Buell, commander of the army which Turchin is a part of, General Order 13A, which says civilians should not be harmed or property damaged. This is a reminder, as is the general rule of war. But to Churchin, they aren't civilians. Now, legally, they are... Now, legally, they are until proven otherwise. So his soldiers will have to decide. But to Turchin, they aren't civilians. Now, legally, they are until proven otherwise, so his soldiers will have to decide. But he won't authorize them for anything more... So on the second, under orders from Mitchell, he retakes Athens. And the rest is even more fuzzy. He goes to his brigade and says, I shut my eyes for two hours. I see nothing. Allowing his forces to do what they wish, without worrying about being reported. He goes off doing reconnaissance in a field, or to some he just lies there. And what do his men do? Well, it varies from account to account. But we know they smash up businesses and take what they want. Others claim the 19th Illinois went on a spree, harassing civilians, bursting into homes, taking what they want. Cause a miscarriage of an upper class woman, her died, and raping a slave. Others say they just stole from stores. That the woman miscarried naturally and died because they were in the middle of a war zone. Someone else raped this poor slave girl and blamed it on the Union to get away with it. All I know is that after two hours of being away, Turchin came back and carried on as normal with some even bragging about their leader's willingness to look the other way. This is what the soldiers want, but officers find it distasteful. Having an officer who will let you loot and pillage is unheard of. Virgin might have hurt himself, because to him, this is how Russia deals when caustics rise up. But to his American comrades, these are family and friends. They aren't an empire or conquerors, but liberators and restorers of justice. For the Cossack, this is justice. At the end of the day, it was a pretty small event, which says something of the horrors of war. But when Major General Buell arrived in Huntsville in July, some Confederate sympathizers told him the story of the 19th Illinois going crazy, which definitely didn't happen. The 19th Illinois is Turchin's regiment. The reason to claim it's the 19th is to further incriminate the man. But the 18th Ohio were disgraced by being run out of the town. If it was any regiment in Turchin's brigade, it's the 18th Ohio. Buell, outraged, always wanted to side with ideas of nobility over his soldiers, brings Turchin up for court-martial on three counts. Neglect of duty. This is for his actions at Athens. Failure to perform proper behavior expected out of an officer and a gentleman. Not paying a hotel bill, which I understand if it wasn't a war and things happen. Failure to obey orders. Keeping his wife with him, which Buell wouldn't allow, which he should, because Nadine Turchin, who has no connection to the other two charges, has stepped in working as a colonel when her husband couldn't drilling and training the men, clothing and healing them, clothing and healing them as a nurse, and being more useful than some staff officers. Turchin at trial requests his legal advocate to be fellow man on trial, Colonel Gasway, who is charged with stealing army property. Turchin's defense is, fuck this. He didn't neglect duty, this is how war is fought. He did pay that bill, and his wife is a valuable part of the army. And if that's against orders, then the order is wrong. Let's break apart his defense. His wife has taken over as colonel. The order is designed for dainty damsels, not this battle-hardened woman of the Russian Empire. As for the first charge, I have tried to teach rebels that treachery to the Union was a terrible crime. My superior officers do not agree with my plans. They want the rebellion treated tenderly and gently. They may cashier me, but I shall appeal to the American people and implore them to wage this war in such a manner as will make humanity better for it. He has dealt with bushwhackers and saboteurs successfully. Those who have gone before him don't survive. This is the way Europe fights its wars. This is the role of the Cossack soldier. War should be brutal and short, not gentlemanly and long. The resources of the Confederacy must be taken by the Federals, and the Union Army should feed from the grain of the rebels. He will execute those who he knows hurt him on a drum if he must, and thus bring the bloodshed to an end sooner. After the war, his actions at Athens earns him the title of Butcher in the South. 
he raped Athens. The lost causers, or apologists for the South, would expand the stories of rape and accuse Turchin of murder. It seems, though, that he never dealt with this in person, having returned to Chicago. No matter. The court finds him guilty because the law doesn't allow for war to be fought like this. Buell made sure of that. But the jury is sympathetic to him and asks Buell for clemency. Buell does not follow the recommendation. He has the stamp he needs and dismisses Turchin from service. But Nadine has a plan and goes to D.C. with an Illinois statesman and asks Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to fix the situation. Turchin is therefore promoted to Brigadier General in mid-July, invalidating the trial because he outranked members of the jury due to backdating. That's a lot of legal issues, but to simplify it, while Buell wanted war to be gentlemanly, the jury didn't, and neither did Stanton, and neither will Sherman. Turchin's way of war spreads as raids become more prominent. The Cossack way of war. Officers across the Union and in the Confederacy live off the land of their opponents and destroy their resources from Lee's invasion of Union Maryland or the March to the Sea in 1864. We see how the war becomes brutal from the war efforts of both sides. Let's focus in on that March to the Sea and General Sherman. Sherman, for those who don't know, ends the war as a major general and commander of the military division of the Mississippi, which he used his control over two armies to execute the March to the Sea, where in a month and a week, he subdued the entire state of Georgia, using similar tactics to Turchin. Remember Turchin's defense? I have tried to teach rebels that treachery to the Union was a terrible crime. My superior officers do not agree with my plans. They want the rebellion treated tenderly and gently. They may cashier me, but I shall appeal to the American people and implore them to wage this war in such a manner as will make humanity better for it. Let's look at Sherman's thoughts on war. You cannot qualify war in harsher terms than I will. War is cruelty, and you cannot refine it. And those who brought war into our country deserve all the curses and maledictions a people can pour out. I know I had no hand in making this war. I know I will make more sacrifices today than any of you to secure peace. But you cannot have peace in the division of our country. If the United States submits a division now, it will not stop. But will go on until we reap the fate of Mexico, which is eternal war. The United States does and must assert its authority wherever it once had power. For if it relaxes one bit to pressure, it is gone. And I believe that such is the national feeling. Turchin thought becomes the way of modern warfare. The rest of the war, he goes on to do great work, which I will cover. But the main story of Turchin is finished with his trial. Nadine goes on to write a diary of the war in 1863, recounting her husband's success at Chickamauga and Chattanooga. He then works under General Sherman, whom he is the predecessor of, and becomes the Russian Thunderbolt. But really, the Ukrainian Lightning. Hello, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here. I would just like to ask everyone to, if they can, please donate the Bob and Yar Historical Memorial Center. I lost family in the Holocaust and their memory, doing the memory of their loss is very important to me. For everyone else, please check out the rest of the playlist. They have many great videos, far greater than mine. And I shall hopefully see you next week.